Good morning everyone. I'm here today to read the third installment of my novel Deadly Election. You'll remember that in earlier episodes the Japanese were losing the war in the Philippines and having hidden their gold they tried to flee but they were killed by incoming American forces. We were introduced to the evil Governor Enrique Consuelo and we now follow him in his travels around the Philippines. With just one runway, the airport in Benguet was used exclusively by the senator and his guests. The short strip had been extended two years ago when he bought a larger Boeing 737. Today, they would be using one of his smaller jets. Airport staff came in only when needed, just a flight controller and an engineer for a final check. They waited in the tower until he arrived. Despite his many international flights, there were no custom staff at the airport. This was a country where the rules did not apply to the rich. Within an hour, they were aloft and halfway to Manila. Can't you keep her any steadier? The white-faced Consuelo barked as his pilot, as the small plane took yet another dive into an air pocket. Sorry, sir, replied the timid young man the most junior of the senator's three pilots. We're so light this time, sir. The plane is being blown around a lot. The wind is much stronger than usual. I know that, he barked. The plane lurched and he fell sideways against the toilet door. He made his way back to the seat and his sick bag. The tail end of Typhoon Maria was still creating winds, causing turbulence for the small 16-seater plane. The senator felt queasy as the light aircraft bogged about in the gale. Jagged ridges of the Cordillera Mountains in the north of the province below seemed too close. The razor-like peaks resembled the edge of a saw. They seemed to go on forever. It was a relief when they touched down at Manila Domestic Airport 60 minutes later. The black Ford expedition waited for them at the side of the runway. Consuelo ran down the exit stairs as soon as the plane was secured into the back of his waiting car. Edita followed close behind. His driver saluted and closed the door after them. The cold leather felt good against his back after a short but brisk walk from the plane. The tropical sun was at its hottest and the buildings of Manila Domestic Airport shimmered in the background. Reporters and photographers gathered at the airport entrance as usual. The car had to slow down to ease through them. He and Aditha smiled and waved. The couple were used to this now. Consuelo's celebrity status had soared since he'd been declared as a presidential candidate. Welcome home, sir, said the driver, an older man and a faithful servant for over 20 years. Thank you, Edward. I'm glad to be back. Is Simon at the house yet? Yes, sir. He showed up the day before yesterday. <clears throat> Simon, his secretary and general fixer, had been taking care of some of the election rigging in the Southern Islands. The senator and Edita arrived at his Manila mansion just before 2pm, after the short drive through the busy traffic. Their home was a spacious mansion in a tree-lined gated community in Bel Air, home to most of the Philippine elite. <coughs> the lanes of the dual carriageway within the area were clean and smooth, with tall coconut palms adjoining the central reservation interspersed with mature banana plants. A lone road sweeper dragged his trolley along the dusty path. The car turned left as the electronic gates parted to allow them in. Even in a street of outstanding homes, theirs stood out. Painted white with a red tiled roof, the 22-roomed mansion with armed guards stationed on the corners was imposing. The staff knew he'd need a rest when he arrived and his room was ready. Power napping had become a thing for him. 
He was soon asleep on the soft covers. Philippine presidential elections were held every six years and the next one was in just a few days now. <coughs> Consuelo knew that if he didn't make it this time, he probably never would. The senator's former friend, President Bautista, stood for a second term, although he was widely unpopular and expected to lose. A not-so-small fortune sat in foreign banks, waiting for him, just in case. If he lost, he would get out of the country while he still could. His successor would certainly try to call him to account for his crimes. Earlier, he'd swept to power on the ticket of anti-corruption, but his promises were now seen to be hollow, and his methods had proved questionable. With his war on drugs resulting in its thousands of extrajudicial killings. <clears throat> in truth, the war on corruption and the fight against drugs were smokescreens to protect his own bribery, extortion and illegal drug dealing and eliminate his opposition. The international community could see what was happening and sanctions were instituted, <coughs> making him even more unpopular at home. Senator Consuelo's power base was in Abra, northern Luzon. He'd spent time cultivating his image, but there were no real worries in his home state. The Consuelo clan had run the state for generations and held the top positions within their family or in their patronage. However, in the last few months, he'd become, begun working with highly paid foreign advisors to ensure that to most of the country, he seemed softer and more intellectual. He now cultivated a more statesmanlike, benevolent persona. It had worked so far. He was climbing the popularity charts, but there were still a few days to go. From now until election day, he just had to keep his nose clean and his election machine well oiled and supplied. To date, he'd spent over $20 million, mostly undeclared and he knew there would be more to pay. His resources diminished and this concerned him greatly. Finding more funds was his priority. The lavish party being organized downstairs was all about consolidating support and raising money. He pondered his problems as Simon rang. The call brought him back to reality. Guests were starting to arrive and he was needed. He'd arranged for the most important guest of the evening to arrive early. <coughs> the well-dressed man strode the short distance from his car to the front door, which opened as he arrived, two bodyguards following. He was dapper, overweight and shorter than his host. The senator wore his best smile as Vice President Arturo Ramos entered the hall. Ramos looked up, returned the senator's grin, and warmly clasped the outstretched hand with both of his own. His old patron, the president, had used and abused the former television presenter, and Ramos counted the days until the election. Welcome, my dear friend, said the senator, shaking the man's hand a tad longer than was necessary. Ramos previously had his own plans to stand for election, which were spoiled by the incumbent's dirty tricks. When the president found out about Ramos' plans, he unleashed a torrent of news and fake news about the man's drinking, womanising, illegal gambling and consorting with foreign agents to the press. Ramos was not too bright and he allowed himself to be caught in compromising situations. <coughs> when copies of his bank accounts surfaced, showing millions in undeclared wealth and deposits from Russian and Chinese sources, he was sunk. But he still had a small loyal following he would put at Consuelo's disposal. 
Consuelo led him through to the small office next to the meeting room, where he offered him the nearest chair. The senator wasted no time. Arturo, you do not deserve what has happened to you, my friend. <coughs> I will find a way for you to reclaim your place. He leaned over and took the man's arm. The president has taken a tight control of the media. You know he's done that deliberately to keep you out. You're a threat to him. Arturo nodded. It'll be one of my first acts to give you the newspapers and the television stations and their independence again. And I want you to be part of my new vision. The vice president looked up. I'd like to install you as the chairman of the Philippine Broadcasting Company. The PBC controlled and regulated the growing number of television and radio stations in the country. As a former broadcaster, Arturo Ramos would be back in a world he knew and at the top of it. It was an irresistible offer. And to emphasise how important I consider the media to be, you'll also be a special presidential advisor one of only 12 people. The vice president couldn't hide his delight. You'll have my full support, my friend. Arturo gushed, reaching forward to clasp Consuelo's hands firmly once again. Ramos' support had put him into a situation where he could do little damage and he certainly didn't intend to take any advice from him. The vice president got up from his chair this calls for a drink. <coughs> the two men drank like old friends. Consuelo nodded at the appropriate places while the vice president rambled on, condemning the current administration and anyone else he could think of for his problems. Consuelo had heard it all before. After 20 minutes, the senator made his excuses. He had to prepare, prepare for the party. Ramos remained, now very merry, with a large glass of whiskey and the rest of the bottle close by. The gathering would start at six. It would likely be the last meeting of his group before the election. They all had work to do in their own way over the coming days. As more and more guests began to arrive, uniformed catering staff met them at the door <coughs> offering water and juice. Large amounts of alcoholic drink would flow after the short business of the day was over. Maids show them to a plush side room to await the others. When they were all assembled, Simon ushered them into the boardroom. The ornate mahogany table stood pride of place with 20 equally ornate chairs. The senator and a groggy vice president stood by the door to greet them. Everyone at the party was a well-known public figure. <coughs> there was an air of celebration and anticipation, exactly what the senator was trying to achieve. Dear friends, we're nearly there. Nothing can stop us now. I know many of you have already worked hard on my behalf and I thank you. He raised his glass. Around the table they nodded and toasted each other. He glanced at his guests, making eye contact with each other as he spoke. When I started my campaign, many said I had no chance. It's thanks to you and other like-minded people who recognise the need for a change that I've managed to get this far. The serious tone of his speech caused the room to fall silent as the senator intended. He had their full attention. I must give you a word of caution. We're entering the most dangerous part of the race now. Many people will try to stop us, to expose any skeletons, real or imagined. Please be on your guard for these last few days. Then we can all relax as we reap our rewards. He raised his glass again. Here is to success, he proclaimed. The assembled guests cheered and again toasted each other. When the chatter in the room subsided, the senator resumed. 
I want to pass you over now to my good friend, the Vice President of our beloved country, the Republic of the Philippines. Ramos stood to speak. He was an imposing figure and an accomplished speaker, even when under the influence of alcohol. He put his arm around the senator, hugged him and smiled. That said it all, but they expected more, and Ramos gave it to them. I'm among friends here tonight, so I can be frank. <coughs> we know the country needs the man we've pledged to support as the next president. Unlike the present incumbent, he knows about loyalty. He's with the people and has the interests of the country as his first priority. In a few days, we'll be celebrating our victory. Ramos praised Consuelo for another five minutes. He told the assembled dignitaries that if there were any problems, all they had to do was to pick up the phone. He finished by giving them his private cell number. Light applause and a pat on the back from the senator came as Consuelo stood to reply. As a humble politician, I'm proud to be in the company of such eminent people here tonight. My vision for our great country is one of prosperity and equality, and to regain our dignity in the eyes of the international community. <laughs> There were sombre nods around the table. <coughs> Consuelo introduced Simon, who stood and smiled. The senator made it clear to them that his secretary was available to them night or day. He'd call each of them daily with updates on the campaign. Simon shook his boss's hand as he sat down. Simon carried on to outline the weaknesses and what was needed to be done and where the campaign needed support and more effort. The church was not yet behind the senator. He needed the bishop's help. He didn't mention the urgent need for more cash. That would make his boss look weak. The Archbishop of Manila had made comments about Consuelo's links to illegal gambling, which in truth funded half of his enterprises. Public denials helped, but over the next few days, the cleric would have to be persuaded to be less vocal in his opposition to the senator. The Catholic Church in the Philippines was strong politically, with support at all levels of society. It held to early ideology inherited from the time of the Spanish occupation. The only way to end a marriage there was by annulment, apart from killing your spouse. Both were popular, but the latter choice was cheaper, with little danger of prosecution, and it was widely practised. Most of the national daily newspapers came round to endorsing Consuelo. The owners, editors and senior journalists enjoyed the largesse of the wealthy senator. Major television channels stayed mostly neutral as the incumbent was unlikely to win. He was currently trailing in third place. They were pleased with rumours that Ramos would soon be back working in the media. It was uncomfortable being the under the sum of President Bautista. Ramos would be a much easier man to manipulate. The army was solidly behind his campaign. They weren't comfortable with the blatant lawlessness allowed by the administration. Consuelo asked the senior servicemen present for details of officers who supported him. They'd ensure the military vote went his way. Each of them would receive a discreet phone call from Consuelo and an early Christmas present. The National Police Chief wrote a similar list. Police General Estrada had served for 35 years, after a short military career. He was six months from retirement and the election would provide a substantial boost to his pension fund. Consuelo promised better pay and conditions to his men, especially the recruits who received little and relied on bribes to survive. It was easy to sell Consuelo to the new president and to his officers. The mayor of Manila, Manuel de Sena, also suffered under the current leadership. 
The president took away control of planning decisions. This was a major loss of income. Bautista had also taken away the lucrative issuance of business permits. <coughs> Consuelo would return both to him. Decina had already received some compensation from Consuelo. He would deliver many thousands of votes from those who lived and worked in the nation's business capital. The senator's face, an airbrushed, much younger looking version, smiled out at commuters from the giant billboards on public buildings all over the city. Harry Chua, one of the richest men in the Philippines, supported Consuelo through his senatorial race and bankrolled him for a large share of the election costs. His family fortune dated back to the Marcos era. Consuelo's and Harry's parents had been good friends and both were dead now, but family loyalty meant everything to a Filipino. Consuelo thanked him for his support, a gesture that would convey to the meeting that money was no object. They could all expect rich rewards at the end. The Senator spoke again. I will need the help of every one of you to implement the policies our country so desperately needs. The group was silent again. I know you share my beliefs and visions and I appreciate I can rely on you to play your part. As he looked around the table, his expression changed. His face relaxed and a broad smile graced his face. And now, my friends, it's party time. Enjoy yourself tonight. You're among friends. Tomorrow we'll work in earnest as we come up to the wire, but tonight we'll play. One girl with an empty tray took up position by the door. Consuelo nodded to her as he spoke to his guests. Please leave your phones on the tray. You'll get them back after the party, but we don't want any secret filming going on tonight, do we? With perfect timing, the side door burst open. Attractive serving girls wheeled in a lavish buffet. Wine and spirits with mixers and ice arrived on two further trolleys. Gradually, the guest wanders onto the more comfortable drawing room with sofas and coffee tables. There were bottles of whiskey and brandy on every table. Edita joined Consuelo. He smiled and gave her a quick hug. Good job, he whispered in her ear. Is the attainment, is the entertainment arranged? Of course. I selected the girls myself and they're all sexy and very discreet. He laughed. I knew I could rely on you as always. Well done. And have the electricians gone? She nodded. I've checked the rooms. Everything works. Everything is fine. He kissed her on the lips. I couldn't manage without you. Thank you, sweetheart. I love you so much. He knew she meant it. The party was now in full swing. Dance music played apparently from the ceiling. It set the mood. Some guests were always in the public spotlight. They rarely let their hair down. Tonight, they took advantage of this opportunity. Well before midnight, more pretty girls appeared and mingled with the visitors. Adita had contacts in many places. Simon often called on her to supply company for the senator's visitors. Tonight she'd done an admirable job. All the young women were stunning and more appealing in their scanty outfits. The happy guests soon paired up with attractive partners, then drifted to the space in the middle of the room that became the dance floor. Two security guards in plain clothes kept an eye on the proceedings, looking out for anyone tempted to take photos with a phone they had not surrendered. It wasn't long before the alcohol and dim lighting had its desired effect. As the music became more relaxed and the lighting dimmed, the senator watched the kissing and groping going on in different corners and smiled. 
Several of the young women were down to their panties now. Two of the girls, one with a large butterfly tattoo high on her inner thigh, were naked. Another bobbed up and down between Harry Chua's legs. As the evening wore on, the guests disappeared off towards the bedrooms with a girl, or sometimes two. One bishop left the party early, and Consuelo and Edita decided they could make their excuses and slip away. Adita noticed a young girl gyrating naked in the corner. Would you like to bring her up with us? Consuelo smiled. Not tonight, sweetheart. I want you all to myself. The other bishop was the last guest to leave the room. He befriended a young, slim serving lad, who he later escorted to his bedroom. That's it for today. Thank you very much. I will read some more to you another time. I do hope you enjoyed it. You can follow me by look, looking at my book on Amazon on the links below or by joining my subscriber links. There's another link below for you to be able to do that. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you again next time. Thank you.